and indeed challenges facing Indian democracy and secularism today. You know, in last year's Independence Day address on the ramparts of the Red Fort, our Prime Minister had spoken of New India. In fact, he liked the phrase so much, he used it 15 times in one hour, New India. But what is this New India that he is trying to create? What becomes increasingly clear to many of us is that it seems to be a New India built on the ruins and ashes of everything that was noble and precious about the old India. One of those issues most definitely is the transformation of the ethos of our country. You know, when we have looked back on the 70 years of India's independence, we have always seen our country as a land for everybody. When Pakistan was created in 1947, because of a demand for a partition in the name of a particular religious community, India, the country that remained as India, never fell into the trap of accepting the argument that religion can be a determinant of nationhood. The argument that India had always decided to stick by was that as a freedom movement, we had actually fought for the freedom of all Indians, and as an independent country, we would stand for a country of all Indians. And our constitution, written by some of the giants of those days, Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar as the chairman of the drafting committee, Dr. Rajendra Prasad as the president of the Constituent Assembly, Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Azad, many great leaders of our country, participated in creating a constitution which embodied the idea that India would be a land of equal rights for all, a land in which, irrespective of your religious or communal background, you had the same rights, the same opportunities as every other citizen. That was the core principle of our democracy for the last 70 years. However, what we have seen since 2014 in our country is a triumphant majoritarianism that has spread a certain idea based on a doctrine that is actually foreign to our constitution, the doctrine of Hindu Rashtra. This doctrine created by ideologues of the RSS from the 1920s has a very different conception of the nation of India from the conception reflected in the constitution and the conception followed by our national leaders. In fact, the critique of our constitution by the RSS leadership and the Jansang leadership was very clear. V. D. Savarkar, the original ideologue who coined the term Hindutva, M. S. Golwalkar, the longest serving Sarsanchalak of the RSS, who headed the RSS from 1940 to 1973 for 33 years, and Deen Dayal Upadhyay, the president of the Jansang, who is hailed even today by Narendra Modi as the principal ideologue that he believes in, all of them explicitly rejected the Constitution of India. They took the view that the Constitution of India should be discarded. They gave two reasons for this. The first, they said, ah, this is a Constitution full of imported Western ideals, written by Anglophone lawyers, in the wrong language. And there you can't do much about that because to some degree that critique is true. It is full of international ideas of life and liberty and freedom and uh, at the same time equality. And of course it was written by English speaking lawyers and was written in English. Even though the English and Hindi texts of the constitution are deemed equally authentic, we all know the draft was initially in English. But the second objection that these that Savarkar, Golwalkar, Upadhyay gave is the far more far-reaching objection. 
They said the Constitution should be discarded because it is based on a wrong premise. What is the wrong premise? They said it is based on the wrong idea of a nation. The Constitution of India assumed that the nation of India is indeed, it assumes that the nation of India is a territory and all the people living on it. The territory called India is covered by the Constitution. Wrong, say the Hindutva ideologues, a nation is not a territory, a nation is a people, and the people of India are the Hindu people. And everybody else, Christians, Muslims, or people whom they don't consider Hindu enough, would have to be essentially guests or interlopers. And we know what they thought, because they actually wrote in very blunt terms, Parsis and Jews are guests. Christians and Muslims are like bandits and dacoits in this country. That was the attitude they had. And from this attitude came their view that they could only be a Hindu Rashtra in India and that others would either live here on their sufferance or would have to leave. In fact, unfortunately, we all know Goldwalka wrote a, a scandalous text in which he actually said that what Hitler did to the Jews in Germany is what should be done to the Muslims in India. Of course, Upadhyay did not go so far. He said that you cannot speak in terms of getting rid of 200 million people from this country. So he said, no, we shall assimilate them. They will have to become more Hindu in their culture, in their orientation, and so on. Now, this is a very peculiar approach because we're looking at a country which has actually been living successfully in peace and democracy for a very long time. If you look around the world today, most countries envy India for our management of our diversity. When I was at the United Nations, I was traveling in the Gulf countries on an official mission when the results of the 2004 elections came in. And I can tell you that the astonishment and admiration with which the officials and ministers of those countries spoke to me of their reaction to the news coming from India that we had had a democratic election which had been won by a political party headed by a woman leader of Italian descent and Roman Catholic background who had then made way for a Sikh to be sworn in as prime minister by a Muslim president in a country that is 80% Hindu. They were absolutely bowled over by this. And as you know, we were not doing this to impress the world. This was India being itself. This was our natural way of dealing with that particular election result. We were not there to impress anybody else. We were there to do the right thing for ourselves. And that was the strength of India. We were a country where everybody of every religious background got along and worked together. That strength is only seen, unfortunately, by those who rule us today as a weakness. For them, this diversity undermines their sense of national pride. It undermines their belief of India as a Hindu Rashtra. I tell them, in 1971, I was actually a high school student at that time, finished my class 11 when Pakistan declared war on India and even proclaimed a jihad against the infidel. Well, they may have declared a jihad, but who were they fighting? The commander of our army, uh, General, later Field Marshal Manikshaw, was a Parsi. The head of the Indian Air Force in the northern sector, Air Marshal, later Air Chief Marshal, Idris Latif, was a Muslim. The commander, GOC in C Eastern Command, who commanded the forces that marched into East Pakistan, was a Sikh, General Jasjit Singh Arora. And the general who was helicoptered into Dhaka to negotiate the terms of surrender of the Pakistani army was Jewish Major General J.F.R. Jacob. That is India. We are a Rashtra of all these people. And that is a strength that India has always celebrated. So by undermining this ethos, those who rule us today 
are undermining the essence of India. When we speak of secularism or Madhyadatram, we have a tendency in our country to slightly misuse the word. Because if you look at the Western dictionary, secularism means the absence of religion, distancing from religion. Whereas we in India, we mean by secularism a profusion of religions. We want all religions to practice and feel free to flourish on our soil. If you look at Western secularism, I'll give you the example of France, where they call it laïcité. In France, you cannot study in a government school or step into a government office wearing any visible sign of religion. You cannot wear a hijab. You cannot wear a Sikh turban. You cannot have a crucifix or a cross dangling from your neck. You cannot show publicly any sign of religion. That is Western secularism, particularly French secularism. In India, we have the opposite. You see all of this in every government school. Your teacher may be wearing a hijab, your student may be wearing a turban, your uh, other students may be having crosses around their necks. It doesn't matter. They might have caste marks because they had gone to the temple in the morning before coming to school. All is acceptable. No one doesn't really. No one particularly minds because the whole point is the state does not favor any one religion. All religions are given opportunities to flourish in our country. That has been the great strength of it. Now today, what are we seeing? We are seeing a situation where this kind of secularism is being challenged and threatened. They have a very interesting vocabulary to discuss this in, in Hindi and in Sanskrit. They say that secularism means dharma nirpekshata. And dharma nirpekshata, they say, is impossible for every Hindu because Hindus are supposed to live by dharma. But in fact, they're not correct because we are actually talking about a profusion of dharma. Let everyone follow their own dharmas. But we believe in what in Hindi would be called Panth Nirpekshata. Do not favor any one form of dharma or any one form of religion or sect. Now this is something that somehow we have not been able to find a meeting of minds on. At the same time, our prime minister says the constitution is my holy book. If the constitution is his holy book, then of course... He must have to disagree with the very man that he hails every day, Mr. Deen Deyal But does he? He has instructed every ministry in New Delhi to conduct seminars on the thoughts of Deen Deyal If the Prime Minister could stand up tomorrow and say, I respect Deen Deyal but I disagree with him on the Constitution, then we would have no problem. But as long as he takes the position that everything Deen Deyal stands for is the gospel truth, then we have a real challenge to the Constitution. What is the biggest danger facing our democracy today is the prospect that they will follow through on these convictions, not only by honoring the individuals they claim to admire. They have put a portrait of Savarkar in Parliament facing that of Gandhi, but that they will actually act on the beliefs of, our, of their own uh, heroes, and they will come back to us with a new constitution. So far, what is preventing them is that they need three things to change the constitution. They need two-thirds of the Lok Sabha, two-thirds of the Rajya Sabha, and half the states. As you know, right now, they have two-thirds of the Lok Sabha with the NDA alliance. They have more than half the states. They control 20 states, and they are in coalition in two more out of 29 states. The only thing they don't have now is a majority in the Rajya Sabha. But because they have so many state governments and the state assemblies elect the Rajya Sabha, you can be sure that within four or five years, they will have a majority in the Rajya Sabha as well. So the great danger then is, if they have been able to win a repeat of their current strength in the Lok Sabha, then frankly, our democratic constitution as we understand it will not survive because then they will have all the three elements they need to tear up the constitution of India and write a new one. And that will be a new one that will enshrine the principle of a Hindu Rashtra, that will remove equality for the minorities, that will create a Hindu Pakistan. And that is not what Mahatma Gandhi, Jawaharlal Nehru, Maulana Azad, Sardar Patel, and the great heroes of our freedom struggle fought for. 
So this is a challenge for our democracy. We have seen how this has already manifested itself. Lynchings by mobs of people accused of having eaten beef. We have had attacks on individuals merely on suspicion that the meat they were carrying was beef. In the name of the cow today, human beings are not safe. In fact, I said in Parliament, sadly it seems that it is safer to be a cow than to be a Muslim in India today, in Modi's India today. That is the situation that we are facing. We are looking at a country in which Dalit boys have been whipped and flogged because they were practicing their profession of skinning a dead cow. And these videos are out there on YouTube in order to teach a lesson to others. This is a big, big danger to our rule of law in this country on which our democracy is built. We are looking at an India in which, sadly, these cherished values are disappearing. Every institution in India is under threat. You look at the judiciary, we remember the press conference of the four Supreme Court judges saying that democracy is in danger. You look at the CBI, we're now hearing it is a caged parrot. You look at the police forces, they come very strongly, where they are under BJP governments, come very strongly under political influence. You look at the fourth estate, the media, what do you find? Even the media is not exempt. Of course, the media is not owned by the government, but the government seems to have very effective ways of persuading the media to stay in line. And it's very interesting that every time a very critical story about some key BJP leader, leader appears in the papers, somehow it disappears the next day from the website of the newspaper. Because, of course, we all know that most of our mass media have, are owned by people who have other business interests. So you don't need to threaten the freedom of the press directly. You simply have to threaten the business interests or the tax interests of the owners, and that would be the end of the freedoms of the press that they are supposed to be protecting and defending. I say all this to you with a great sense of anguish as well as responsibility. No, we are not a fascist state, as some people on the left have been saying. That is a premature judgment, and by applying hasty labels, we actually undermine the real dangers. Because if you put a hysterical label like fascism, then immediately you are in a position where the rest of your arguments are seen to be exaggerated as well. Everything I've told you is accurate, factually based and researched. There is no exaggeration there. So let us not use extreme language. But let us say that our democracy is vulnerable from the inside. Just last month, we had the anniversary of the emergency, the 33rd anniversary of the emergency. And we had every single BJP leader, including the vice president of India, writing articles and making speeches saying that the Congress party had been a threat to democracy during the emergency. And we must always remember to be vigilant against those who would take away our freedoms. The Congress party, as you know, since those dark days has been a strong force for strength of liberty, of democratic institutions and freedoms. It has been in no way in any stages of any of the governments it has run a menace to democracy. So why should the BJP today speak about that? Because by attacking, a, 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 a demonizing a particular practice in which indeed a formal emergency was declared, Leaders were officially arrested, and, as you know, the press was even openly censored. They can say, see, we are not doing any of these things. But what we have today is an undeclared emergency. You don't need to arrest leaders. You can have cases against them. You don't need to actually um, censor the press directly. You can intimidate their owners. You can co-opt their owners. The result is... Without declaring an emergency, you can achieve everything that the emergency had sought to achieve. That is a bigger danger for our democracy. And so it's extremely important when we speak about the, the challenges to our democracy today that we respect and understand the nature of the problems that face us. Democracy and secularism go together because the equality of our people, without distinction of religion, community, caste, and creed, 
is also part of the core strength of our democracy. So we need to preserve secularism, or pluralism as I sometimes prefer to call it, in the same spirit that we want to preserve our democracy. I've already been given the signal that I'm late for my next function, so I'm going to bring this argument to a close. But let me stress once again, all is not lost. We have enough people who believe in democracy. We have enough people in this country who will stand up for our rights. We have an election coming up which we hope will be completely free and fair, and the public of India will have an opportunity to rectify its own convictions at the ballot box. Let us today stand up for our democracy that is under threat. Let us stand up for our secularism and our pluralist way of life that has been directly attacked and menaced. Let us defend our constitution, which protects our democracy and our rights. Let us work to creating a different kind of new India from the new India that the Prime Minister has been speaking about. Let us create a new India that preserves the great strengths of the old India, but looks forward to a brighter future for all our people. Thank you very much. Yeah.